Good, so let's talk about uh, marketing performance and uh, driverless AI. My name is uh, Martin Stein, I'm with uh, Chi5, it's a marketing company. I'm with Chief Analytics Officer and I have with me Jeff. Hi, Jeff Hazel, I'm a senior software engineer for G5. I uh, do a lot of, of our data engineering, DevOps and ML ops. So quick note, um, so we're gonna talk about our journey how we actually implemented uh, from zero. Nobody was doing any ML, any machine learning, any AI in our company, and how we actually started our project and really got within three months to really fantastic results. We're gonna walk you and take you through, this, through the journey about what has happened and basically show you a little bit about the environment of our company as well. So G5 is a leader in marketing optimization for real estate marketing. What we do is basically find leads for our customers in multifamily, self-storage, and senior living, and we basically make sure that their vacancy rates and their properties and apartments are pretty low. Um, this is kind of like literally the view that marketers or language that marketers speak, and what you see here is basically uh, a, a view of uh, owned media, paid media, and earned media, and why is that so important? Um, it comes down to one thing, like in today's uh, digital age, a renter, potential buyer of any services has a so-called buyer's journey. What happens is people touch a website, a blog, or go on to a social ad, and what they do is basically leave a breadcrumb. Now for us marketers, you probably have heard those terms, we talk about first touch and last touch attribution, and what we would like to do is to understand what people have done and then basically take that formula and make it better. Now here's one of the, um, I would say, dirty secrets in our industry. Um, the most important interaction that you have is actually not something called the click, even so they always talk about click through, but the most important interaction that you have is actually a call. Now for us, that's where the problem starts because it's pretty easy to take a form and from look at a form about, yes, I would like to rent something and, and just take that information and say, that's a very valuable lead. Now, if somebody calls, it's a very, very different story because then you have unstructured data at that point and how do you deal with that data? And so basically what we figured out in our research is that about 90% of all the interactions are actually not clicks, they're calls. And now if you look at the calls and you look at the propensity to lease, one out of seven calls is actually has commercial intent and people would like to rent something. And so that taking into account uh, literally um, is, is the most important piece that we have to solve. That's the puzzle that we have to solve for our customers. And the problem that we have been faced with was the need to classify caller intent. If we classify caller intent correctly, then what it leads to is basically we can do it, uh, you know, track qualified leads, including calls automatically. We can do this at scale. That's one of the very important pieces. We can measure the marketing channel efficiency because if you basically understand at the very funnel of, uh, at the very bottom of the funnel about that this is a high propensity, a qualified lead, you can do a reverse funnel analysis and see what was the most important channel that actually led to this and what are the steps leading up to that qualified lead. So those are very important things. Also, if you have a scored intent within seconds, maybe a minute, for an operator, the operator knows how to, in a, in a rental facility, the operator knows how to follow up with whom quicker, and so you, what you do is like you provide a higher level of customer satisfaction. So what we have done is basically put forward a product, we call it intelligent lead scoring or call scoring, and uh, this presentation is a short story about uh, how long it took, how many people it took, going from zero to 100 with, with call scoring and lead scoring. So turning vision into reality, um, was a time frame of about three months. So we started about a year ago um, looking at calls. Uh, we took about a hundred and something thousand calls, had people listen to them and hand score them manually. So in five categories, not only what is a lead and what is not a lead, but maybe somebody wanted to just have information, somebody might wanted to complain about uh, something not working. So we needed to categorize this. What we have done is build a training set and we listened to 110,000 calls and classified each of those calls. We basically did about 1,600 calls manually in classification a day, and it took a little bit to put this training set together. Uh, one of the lessons learned during a training set is when you have people, multiple people building your training set, consistency and briefing those people is really, really important. So in the beginning, we didn't really, we're total rookies, so we didn't really 
um, spend much time about the consistency part, but giving them a really, really good example about what is a lead and what isn't, what isn't a lead is really important. So we had to basically look at the first you know, 2,000, 3,000 leads that we actually had scored and realized quickly that there's no consistency and the human error between calling something a lead versus not a lead is actually not very conducive to building a model. And so after those lessons learned, we put up a, uh, came up with a questionnaire and made very uh, sure that people scoring, building a training set, uh, going by the same rules. And then we tested this and looked at, you know, samples uh, every day and made sure that, you know, training, uh, the training set is being built in the correct way. At the same time, around, um, you know, March, uh, around that time, we put the data science stack together. And for us, it was actually a very simple decision because we were using um, a um, uh, HO3, the open source product, uh, for a little bit, just for test environments. We haven't built any products with it, but what we did is actually using HO3 uh, and take the word to vec model builder in HO3, which was, I think, uh, introduced about a year and a half ago from HO, and took all of the um, uh, all of the calls that we had, build training sets, and let uh, the word to vec model, you know, come up with the vectorization of the calls. So we decided to go with you know, many different settings, tested a few things, and decided to go with uh, a Virtuvec model with 500 vectors, uh, window size that's a little bit larger, over eight, um, and then kept testing and kept using AutoML to really understand what is the right setting for Virtuvec. Now, what comes out of that when you build your Virtuvec model is basically a 500 vector uh, uh, a feature set with 500 features plus your label that you predict. And uh, that was basically enriched with some metadata about the call. So when did the call happen? What day of the week? How long did the call take? And um, uh, potentially even a few other uh, factors like what day of the month and so on. Um, so then we took that, enriched, that, enriched with metadata, and put that call uh, basically back into a driverless AI. And the choice for driverless AI was a very simple one for us because it allowed us to, to, to do two things. We didn't have to worry about um, class imbalances or target encoding or variable encoding. Um, so we didn't have to worry about much of the things that we knew that it would have to, somebody has to take care of. Uh, so Triverless AI basically did the job uh, and came up with a prediction that uh, we tested in real world as well. We looked at the holdout prediction and uh, what you can see is that it was actually a very, very high real world prediction, about 95% accuracy. We started with 89 and worked our way all the way up to 95%. And uh, with that part, uh, having that high prediction, I think it's really important to understand now for us as a small company, how do we take that model with a really, really good prediction and hand it over to, to a DevOps team and put it in production in our products? That was a major challenge for, for, for us. And quite frankly, uh, driverless AI, AI made it very simple. And that's where Jeff is going to talk about uh, the production part for a second. Sure. Yeah. So uh, as Martin said, you know, we became fairly confident with what uh, he had built largely in H203 uh, and in driverless. But uh, as a matter of putting it into production, uh, we need to be confident that um, we can put that predictor into production and, and make it available to our, our clients as a product. Uh, and so uh, we did a few things in order to make that happen. Uh, here we have uh, in this visualization, uh, this is for um, showing how we get from, uh, from that data to a predictive model. Uh, and then in a minute we'll um, speak about how that um, predictive model gets out into production. Uh, and so as Martin said, um, we hand scored uh, about 109,000 uh, phone calls actually. Uh, we staged that data uh, up in S3 um, and we spun up an AWS EMR cluster, a uh, large Spark cluster running um, our studio and H2O. Uh, and in our case, it was relatively small actually, um, just, just at three nodes um, with a pretty decent amount of memory. Um, we went through, uh, ingested that data, built those word to vex, uh, and then uh, exported um, those word to vex uh, as POJOs, actually. Uh, and so we exported those, and uh, on the far right there, you'll see AWS Lambda, uh, and this is an important point um, that I want to kind of underscore right here, but I'll get back to in a second. 
uh, we exported those Word to VEC POJOs and uh, we pulled them into AWS Lambda and then referenced those from EMR. And that becomes uh, important uh, later on in the productionizing. Uh, and then at that point, uh, once we, um, we use the EMR to, to go out to that Lambda, build our, or convert our, our 109,000 um, call rows down to a coherent data set, uh, and then ingest that in driverless AI uh, and come up with that predictive scoring model, which we then output as a mojo. And it's actually pretty interesting um, in seeing some, you know, some talks over the last day. Um, you know, we, we were actually uh, at a point with driverless and with the mojos where we were waiting for uh, the mojo to be released uh, as an option for us. And so you know, in, in seeing some of these talks, I think um, if we were to design it today, we're, there's a few tweaks we might make um, to how we're doing things, and, and we may go back to the office and do some of that. Um, but uh, you know, we were on the bleeding edge of mojos with this, and so it's pretty cool to, to see it, it work um, on the live bleeding edge. Yeah, and um, so what you see here, and I think that's a really good point, Jeff. I mean, this is something that we took with driverless uh, 1.52 just recently. So what you see here is kind of like, um, really the model performance still using word to vector and what if you look at uh, the variable importance right here you see like uh, the word to vector uh, the C, C columns and so on the C features those are all basically your word to vector features that we put in there and you can see how uh, driverless AI basically took its own NLP function so we basically use TensorFlow and driverless AI plus the, the word to vector model that we have built and we got a pretty, pretty decent performance out of it. So we always felt like with the imbalance that we had to see there and we had to account for, we corrected it in some ways, the output and the outcome, uh, it was pretty decent. And so if, you, if, you, if we would right now, if you're moving forward at some point, NLP on driverless AI is not so good that I would actually make the decision we can actually skip the word to vec uh, step at this point because the performance drop is actually not that significant anymore. Actually, what you gain is something that's really important, what you see with MLI out there. Now you can understand a lot more about how your features work together, how the variables work together, and you gain a lot in understanding about what's work, what works versus what doesn't work. So I think that was a really, I mean, that's just an example of, of some of the tests we ran, ran lately, but I have to say driverless AI and, and the version since 1.4, but very specifically with 1.5, made our lives uh, a lot, lot easier. And so I think as we move forward, as I said, uh, we, we have a, a very, very, uh, a much simplified stack that we can work with. Yeah, so uh, stepping back just a bit. Um, so for me, um, you know, I'm an engineer. I come from a DevOps background. Uh, I had some machine learning experience putting uh, models into production uh, years and years ago. But, uh, you know, when I kind of came onto the team with Martin, um, my my concerns were more DevOps related, making sure that you know the products we build are um, reliable uh, and able to to be used by our customers. And so, um, you know, there's these four things that really are of concern from that DevOps background. We've got reliability, uh, re reproducibility, scalability, uh, and iterability. So for me, you know, reliability obviously hugely important. We need to make sure that things are up and running. Um, so that you know, when our customers expect these calls to be scored, it's there when they need it. Um, reproducibility is also key. Uh, if it works correctly, you know, things can seem like magic, but if things start to break down, you have to be able to explain uh, what it is that's going on. And so that's actually, again, you know, in the last uh, two days, hearing about some of the explainability stuff, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, you know, in terms of reproducibility, um, there's also scalability. Um, as you might imagine, we get a lot of calls uh, in the middle of the day or on weekends. Uh, in the middle of the night, we don't get a lot. So we want to be able to make these predictions uh, at scale uh, without slowing down, without you know things queuing up and backing up. Uh, and so scalability uh, as calls come in is, is pretty huge. Uh, iterability also, we have to be able to make a model, be really confident in it, and then realize we made a mistake and uh, <laughs> go through and, and put in a, a bigger, better model. Uh, we have to be able to track those changes, compare those models, uh, and make sure that um, you know we can iterate uh, model over model, and um, H2 allows us to do all those things. So uh, the reason I uh, mentioned, and you kind of underscored the, the Lambda setup uh, that we're using before, uh, is because of, of this. This is the production version of, of our predictions uh, in, um, you know, in, in our production uh, stack. And so what's important uh, in, in the previous slides, a few slides back, uh, there's a feature building Lambda. And uh, you know, I've 
I, like I said, I, I spent some time uh, years ago putting some you know, predictive models into production, and one of the things that uh, bit us back then uh, was the reproducibility of that feature building and making sure that those things were consistent. And so what we do is we actually use the same uh, lambda in this case. And so you know, a phone call comes in, uh, we transcribe that phone call, and then the, the lambda that actually runs the word to vec models and uh, kind of curates and, and massages the metadata, that's the same exact lambda uh, that we're using in training the models as we're using in production. And so it's really important to me uh, and, you know, to us in general because we know for a fact that it's the same Python code running the same word to vec models uh, that we use on the training side. And so we, you know, we run 109,000 calls through that uh, and come up with our training set. And then that same lambda is running in production to actually, um, you know, prepare things for the prediction. Uh, and so, yeah, so, you know, we go from phone call to transcription uh, to feature um, building and vectorization. Uh, the metadata, we augment that with, and then, you know, call by call, um, we score those calls, and they end up in our dashboard for our clients to, uh, you know, it's actionable data for them to, to make decisions based off of. And so, uh, just to kind of call out some of the key features, uh, I've kind of said some of this already, but... Um, the key features of, of H2O and Pojos and Mojos that, um, you know, even just a year ago were kind of new and uh, really exciting, and they still are, um, you know, that really helped us get things out there. Um, we, can, we can do things like model changes without code changes. Um, you know, with, we're actually loading um, these, these models, these word vec and Mojos um, out of driverless. We're loading them at runtime out of S3, and so we've got some Python and some Java in each of those cases that goes out to S3, pulls in the model, loads it, and runs it. And so if we need to iterate quickly, we can just drop a new POJO in S3. And then we're, we're, using, we're using that model to predict. Uh, another big thing uh, between Martin and I, Martin's a, an R guy. I'm more of a Python guy. And so that seamless transition that we get where we can kind of, you know, I, I try and write a little bit R. Martin tries to write a little bit of Python. And, but we can translate. Um, through H2O and, and get things done without really missing a beat. Um, and also versioning and accuracy tracking are, are pretty huge. We need to, to make sure we can you know, track model over model what it is that we're doing. Uh, and just to quickly kind of enumerate, um, you know, we, we did a lot of this in AWS and um, use a lot of their services. Uh, we use uh, EC2, um, uh, large instance to run driverless AI. EMR, as I mentioned in S3, are, are are pretty crucial to our, our operation. Uh, and Lambda, and one thing I didn't mention is uh, step functions, which are kind of logical uh, organization of lambdas uh, in kind of like a flow chart. And so it's a programmatic way to uh, organize these little bits of code, which are lambdas, and that allows us to wrap our entire call scoring pipeline in this kind of um, singular step function uh, and, and trace it as it goes through from uh, call to score. Yeah, and uh, if you look at uh, the outcome, the summary that we can see on the business side, obviously, I mean, there's a, a lot to, only a staff of two, let's say we had the help of another engineer, uh, made that happen within three months of, of work, including the hand scoring. So if you think about putting something in production, that is not a lot of time. And so for us, it was like literally we had to do this besides our jobs in order to make it happen. So it was really fantastic having the tools we had because if you look at the outcome, uh, the outcome is actually pretty fantastic. We created real world um, accuracy scores of 95%, as I mentioned earlier. And the other piece is actually also, uh, as we took the model to, to production, we started something called a research pilot. Now, if, if you ever take a model into production, I think that's something that uh, is now so much easier because with uh, uh, driverless AI and uh, MLI functionality that you have in there, and also you know you look at uh, literally what's happening in your model, you understand much more what's going on there. So that gives also people who actually work with your models, you know, that information is very inf uh, important information. So we took about three months to test all of our models in real world time and real world scenarios. And I would highly recommend don't rush from a model that you build, you know, into production if you're not really sure that the model is good. Now. How, where I contradict myself is the level of trust that we have seen that I have put into driverless AI has gone from, yeah, somewhat really good to, oh my God, I really trust that product. And so that now allows me to speed up the process in a way that I actually can be much more confident. And this is really a key statement I want to make because if you look at the benefit that we have created, 
that's in two areas. We have a two and a half times uh, lift on conversions compared to the industry average, leveraging those call scores and lead scores and use them again in marketing um, as a part of basically your marketing mix. Um, also, Google has come to us and has uh, said, well, you guys are one of the very few in the industry. There's only one other company they know of who is actually enriching Google advertising uh, with information as, as important as what we have. And so we're really the only ones doing this in real estate. Um, and I would say uh, what you learn out of this, that this is just our very first step. It was very successful. Helps a lot. We save tens of thousands of hours of our uh, of, of customers picking, not have to pick up the phone and understand what the call is about because we automate it and you get the result within minutes and actually in some cases even faster. But I think once you establish that pattern of their success, now the door is open and what has happened from a team of two, that's what we started with, now we have a team of six data engineers, a team of five, four data scientists, and now we have you can imagine a lot more work, <laughs> uh, but also with the scalability and actually the functionality that we have with driverless AI, it's something that we, we don't worry about. And so I think um, that was a, for us, I think a lot of lessons learned. If I would look back and would say, what would I do differently? The only thing that I would say, I would have been, I would have hoped for driverless AI 1.4 to be av available a year earlier. That would have been fantastic. But other than that, I think it's a good product. You can start your data science uh, practice with driverless AI, and you're going to like it. And I would add too. I mean, it says two technical staff. I think it's uh, important to call out that uh, half of one of those uh, technical staff should be a brilliant junior engineer who uh, can do half of your work for you uh, really quickly. And we have a guy named Kirk, uh, who I just have to give a shout out to for, for building a lot of this. <laughs> All right. Oops. That's it. Thank you very much. There are a couple of questions, so if you can take Okay. So yeah, so, so that's actually a pretty good question. So, so actually what we're doing is actually, yes, we retrain the model. We, we have a continuous uh, ongoing set also for, for hand scoring. So when we did the f pilot phase, uh, we basically gave our customers also a hand scoring tool so they can actually hand score all the calls on their side. It's very controlled, very structured. And so basically what we do is then retrain the model, detect for, for, for the shift that we see there. And actually the, the bigger part that I was always uh, worried about is actually not so much the shift so much, but at, at the end of the day, the imbalance, the class imbalance that I see with the models. Because if you think about one out of seven calls is only a call with commercial intent, you can see about you know, what the labels will look like, would look like. Um, so, so how to maintain the models and how often do we refresh? Um, so, so we built a lot, lot more models uh, on, on a weekly basis than we put in production because we compare. And some of the really important features that I'm actually really excited about is the project support with driverless uh, AI. Well, one point, uh, I think it's in 1.52, or I think it's in 1.52, if you set the configuration file correctly. That, that functionality actually allows us literally to, to maintain the models and see how often we have to really refresh when we see some gains. And so we don't refresh just for a little bit of a gain or for, for much more interpretability, but we basically look at right now a, a monthly cadence of refreshing the models and deploying them into production. I think I, I'll add on to that really quickly. I think we're we're looking at um, and implementing doing more blue-green testing too and kind of putting models into production alongside each other and then being able to choose, um, you know, which is better as we go. Right. And uh, I, I think fantastic question that you get here. What is your biggest internal organizational challenge and uh, how long were, you, uh, were the procurement, legal battles? Of course, we, there's, a, there's a lot that you have to make sure of. There's, there's information that you have to... Uh, there's, um, a governance that you have to comply with. There's the Fair Housing Act. You can't discriminate uh, anyone by any of the you know, age, uh, national origin, and so on. So you have to take care and you have to really look about what you model, that your model doesn't actually um, you know, discriminate or that there's a bias in your model. And so that is why what we have seen right now with MLI, uh, understanding literally about where models are actually could be biased and go back to the learning part, that's something that is really, really important. You don't see people in the industry really talking about that uh, functionality or that, that the importance of that. And so for us, it was very important. So we had to make sure that uh, in some areas, uh, we have uh, no PI in the data set. Uh, nothing that could actually identify anyone personally, so it's just like uh, redacted. And on the other side, what you have to make sure as well is that when, when you look at the result, 
that the result actually doesn't show uh, any bias as well. And so that's a, that's a really big part. So on the compliance side internally, of course, you have a legal uh, team that, that goes through with you about the uh, specific constraints that you have, HIPAA compliance and so on, if you would go in a market where HIPAA is applicable. But I think all of that took for us uh, about, I would say, uh, two months and then other regulations like GDPR were popping up uh, last year and so you go to GDPR and what you do is an ongoing sync between legal, your legal department and actually your, what you do on your model and putting the model out and testing the model. So I don't think there's a start and an end to that process. I think that's an ongoing process. Make sure that when you work with your legal department that you have somebody who is actually understands what you're doing and can give you the right feedback. Yeah, that kind of flows into the next question too. Uh, the definition of lead is different for each industry. How do you plan to scale to different industries and companies? So our, our legal uh, concerns are different per vertical uh, for us. Right. And so, so the lead definition is uh, w with actually with the industry very different. So what we do is basically train, build different models and then apply them just for the area that it matters. So we would have to, we will have to go uh, you know, back to the training table if we actually make sure that a lead for, let's say, if we would go into hospita hospitality, that would be a very different story, right? So we'd have to retrain everything. What we also learned is, uh, give you, that's actually a very good example. If you go and have somebody rent a storage unit, that conversation is a very different conversation. It's like, I would like to rent eight by eight with cl uh, climate control, right? Versus uh, having a, an apartment with a view and a dog park somewhere close by. Very, very different conversations. And so what we started out with, taking all the three uh, verticals that we have together and build one model of the three verticals. And of course, you know, it's not as good as if you separate each and look at the conversation that happens in each of those verticals because it's a very different conversation. Interesting as well is, you know, there's, there's differences in the conversations between East Coast and West Coast, North and South, right? Uh, time of the year, seasonality. So, so you have to account for all of that. And I think if you would do this all to a certain degree on a manual basis, uh, it would be coming actually uh, a, a very, very big task. So we actually are pretty excited having uh, some of the very helpful functionality in driverless AI. I think that's it. That's it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Jeff. Thank you so much.